<laughs> All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to March's Green Living Workshop. We're all looking forward to summer, right? Yeah. Yay, landscaping and flowers, so it's good. Um, first, I want to respectfully acknowledge that we are in the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy members Siksika, Pekani, and the Kainai First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, Bearspaw, Shiniki, and Wesley First Nations, the Dene of Tutina First Nations and the Métis Nation Region 3 and all those who make Treaty 7 lands their home. As Treaty people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, we share the responsibility for stewardship of this beautiful land. So again, thanks all for coming. Love having a big full room and then we have lots of people online, which is great. Um, so I'm excited to hear from Joanna tonight. So this is Joanna. She's our lovely Hello. speaker. Um, Joanna is a longtime landscape artist person, I would say. Um, I've heard her speak before, and some of you might have as well, the Garden Club, three years ago, almost yeah. like to the week, because yeah. you were the last Garden Club in-person presentation before, yeah. COVID. before COVID. I recall that. Yeah. Yeah, that so was lovely. So um, she's going to tell us all about xeriscaping, which is something most of you probably know that we highly encourage here in Okotoks. Uh, being in a region where we like to practice water conservation as much as we can. So um, you also hail from the Calgary Horticultural Society. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure she'll fill you in on all her other fun personal details. I'll so, keep it short. <laughs> oh, good. So thank you so much for thank being you. here tonight yeah. and take her away. Thank you. Uh, this is such a beautiful space to present. Okay, I have the blue light. Perfect. All right, does that better? Yeah. Okay, the first part didn't really matter anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guts of the of the evening. So, um, I'm just I'm really honored and and also inspired by the rising interest in this type of gardening, um, especially in light of sort of the last few years weather events that we've had. If you think back to 2013, we had floods in Calgary. Um, I would have to look at my gardening journal, but think of how many hailstorms have happened since 2013. <laughs> um, you know, and then also mixed into that, we've had drought conditions for the last four or five years. We're still technically in a drought. So just like the whole roller coaster ride of weather is what we get here. And some of it is somewhat normal. Um, you know, people are always blown away by our Chinooks, but we're used to them because we know. We live here, we know what they're like, um, but there are anomalies in weather and they're getting more extreme and more pronounced and harder to predict, um, even though we've kind of had some fair warning that things were about to get shaken up. So this is a great way to respond to some of that weather. Um, yeah, so I think you're probably, if you're gardeners, you're already a pretty hardy bunch because you've survived a lot of that weather. Um, I think you probably all have a deer problem down here in Okotoks. <laughs> I hear from from clients in this area that deer are just they're just like a plague. And I I can feel for you. I live near Fish Creek Provincial Park in Calgary, so um, 
they come and fertilize my front garden all the time. And I've learned very quickly what not to plant out in the front yard where they have access. <laughs> um, lots of rock work out there. So the good news, as you know, aside from all the sort of doom and gloom of weather changing and and restrictions on water and and just sort of this general sense that things are getting tighter and harder, um, we do have these tools and techniques at hand that we can start to use. Um, and yeah, we all know that gardening in the Sh the Chinook zone is not for the faint of heart. You're already a hardy crew, and those watching at home as well. Um, yeah, so as we come to this sort of ever increasing crisis point with our weather and our climate here, a good place to start is our garden. I often feel sort of helpless and floundering, but when I go out in my garden, I feel grounded, I feel inspired and I feel hopeful and I drag my kids out there. I want them to see the potential for some positive impact. Some, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. We actually have room to make a difference. And this town of Okotoks, I'll show in my slide, is making a difference right away. Like with the water restrictions, we can grumble about them or we can embrace them. And then we can celebrate what that does for our whole municipality, our whole region, our whole watershed and beyond. Um, so chances are, you've already heard of the term Xeriscape. It's been around for a while now, um, but it's often misspelled, zero, zero scape, or it's mispronounced, or it's just generally misunderstood. Um, so the actual term has been around for about 40 years. And the, I'd like to mention, though, that the concepts draw on a collective of, of knowledge, agricultural knowledge, plant growing knowledge that goes back before European contact. So nothing new but we just decided to call it this, and now we, we label it Xeriscape. Um, you can call it water-wise gardening, you can call it dry land gardening, um, but if you wanna sound really fancy, you can call it Xeriscaping. And so, um, yeah, and you know, whether you know the term or not, probably many of us are actually already doing water-wise landscaping, um, just because it's a fad and it's building and we see things sort of flounder and die and we don't want to put a ton of maintenance into our gardens anyway. So a lot of the things we're doing, a lot of the fads we're following now um, already follows their escaping. And you don't, I, well, the misnomer is that a lot of people think um, it's all like cactus and stone and maybe a couple wagon wheels or you know, cattle skulls or something like that. And it can be, if that's your aesthetic, like all the power to you, but it doesn't have to be like tumbleweed blowing through. It can be it can be more lush, it can be green, it can be colorful. Um, yeah, so anyway, props to the to the origination of the term. It comes from Denver water in Colorado. So um, in combination, uh, sorry, the Greek word is zero, which means dry and then landscaping. So that's where the word kind of was coined. And it was in the 80s, um, Denver water and some affiliated nonprofits sort of partnered up. Uh, to educate their public around water use in the garden. Oh yeah, I get to click, click so I don't lose ya. Um, yeah, so this is one of their demonstration gardens in Denver. I, they're, our sister, they're Calgary's sister city. And the reason for that, many reasons for that, but climate wise, they're along the Eastern spine of the Rockies. We have a lot of similarities with, with, Col with this area of Colorado. Um, it's often compared to our home turf because of the elevation, the geography, the climate, and the wildlife. Um, so they also contend with deer, mule deer, and white tails, and they also have jackrabbits and all the other fun things that come and graze on our newly planted gardens. So here in southern Alberta, we're familiar with how the land feels as it turns from prairies to foothills to Rockies, and so are they. They have that same sort of zone. Um, and also coldness. Their winters are similar as well. I don't think they get Chinooks like we do, so we're even tougher than they are. But um, yeah, so uh, something else that's, that we have in common is our soil. So we have, we're often working with really difficult clay heavy soils here. That's sort of predominantly southern Alberta. And you'll see that along that eastern sort of edge of the Rockies as well. Lots of heavily compacted soils. And that's just how tectonic plates and mountains have moved and compacted things and glaciers have receded and that's what we're left with 
Um, we don't even get so much of that. And I would I would wager that that little nice loam at the top was brought in. That's not naturally occurring, <laughs> right? And same with the fill. So this is kind of like what we have. Um, if you're in a development, uh, you know, maybe not so much. Uh, if this is probably what you see right around your house territory, but the general landscape is this clay. And that's why we don't see a ton of diversity in our trees um, or our, our shrubbery because they have to be able to handle that already compacted clay soil. Um, extreme weather conditions, as I talked about. Uh, we've got the flooding in Calgary. This is my son's hands last summer. So hail, he's not that little anymore. So we all know what it's like to have hail pelt our garden maybe multiple times a summer. Um, yeah, so it's it's hard because these weather patterns are really unique and they kind of they kind of wallop us and the rest of southern Alberta or going farther south, they kind of escape some of the some of the more intense stuff that we get. So pat yourself on the back if you've lived through hailstorms, Chinook damage, flooding, drought, maybe even wildfire, you know, fallout from the wildfires. It's 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 intense to garden here. Um, persistent winds, deer, all of that. And if you still come out of it unscathed with the joy of gardening, then like that's the most amazing thing. That's a miracle to me. Um, so yeah, along with weather and geographic similarities, that wildlife piece that I mentioned. Um, and these guys don't they don't mind borders and you know edges of maps and things same like the flora they travel we get a lot of wind here so things often do kind of disperse themselves from north to south so these are animals that you would see in denver and their response to their escaping and some of their ideas around that are really well suited for our, our area right so the reason for land, well, the, the guts behind land, uh, their escaping, there's seven principles. And this is what Denver Water came up with when they coined the term their escaping. So that's what it is. And now how do we do it? Um, so don't worry about writing these all down. I'm going to go through them one at a time. There's seven of them and we'll spend a little bit of time on each one. Okay. So the first would be smart planning and design of existing and intended aspects. So that's working with what you got. You got to think about your house. Um, it's not just the structures, but the environmental realities, such as how much sunlight comes through, how windy is it typically, what microclimate are you in, and what is your budget, if there is one, and most people have one, um, and how the site might evolve with the people that live there. So for example, maybe I've got young children now and they really need that trampoline and all the grass dies under that trampoline. And if I can, chances are we'll have to do things more than once, but let's try to not do them more than twice. So I say yes to the trampoline and I put it somewhere where I want a future patio or a vegetable bed, <laughs> right? So try and use your existing conditions for future conditions. Try and evolve instead of going, okay, all that goes clean slate start again because that's where budgets get blown and people get tired and turned off of gardening and that's the saddest thing so try and work with what you've got and think a little bit farther down the line for where it's going to go um, so these photos show uh, an initial concept design that i did for some folks in vulcan and they wanted me to come out and this is their house this is a driveway they ha i'll show some photos in a second this is sort of their front yard and they all their plants and grass and everything along the driveway died and they could just couldn't get it to stay alive and then they also had this area many of you will have the sort of strip along the side of the house that doesn't get great sunlight it's not wide enough to put a patio or a shed or much like that so it's sort of this little zone that's sort of dead for a lot of a lot of urban houses what do you do with that like 10 feet 8 to 10 feet wide or five feet sometimes what do you do with that space you have to get to the backyard but like is it just a gravel pathway is it a dog run what do you do there so um so they asked me to come out and and have a look at these areas and we came up with this idea um let's see i don't want to advance just yet we came up with this idea that we would rework this area a little bit smarter than what was there before, which was just like 30 year old junipers. And then this area 
which was a bunch of storage and dying lilacs because it was too shady. They never got blossoms on them. So what's the point? <laughs> um, we were going to change that into a dry creek bed, which is very xeriscape-y. That dry creek bed using rocks, using smart plantings tucked into the stonework. Um, so this was the front yard before. And that's how it looked when I came. So they had ripped out the junipers and they tried to reseed the lawn multiple times with no success. You can't really see, but there's a quite an incline here. So most of the seed would run off. They'd get a bunch of runoff from the house and it would all wash away all their grass seed and they just kept repeating. They're getting really frustrated and spending lots of money on something that wasn't working. Um, so we went ahead and really ripped out that area because we figured the junipers had depleted the, the soil. And then we put in um, some smarter plantings. This isn't a finished picture. We edged it nicely and all that, but this is sort of in progress. Um, the weeping caragana can actually take some salt spray. So caraganas, you might know of caraganas. Um, the wild ones are a little bit harder to tame. They're often used as shelter belts on acreages and farms. Um, but we have these cool little city cousins, the caraganas that weep, and they are sort of pretty. So they can, they are actually in the legume family. So they're busy fixing atmospheric nitrogen into the soil. And so some of these uh, spruce, nest spruce and mugo pines benefit from some of that. And then we kind of anchored in some of the steepness uh, of that slope with some boulders and we top dressed with mulch. So aside from the boulders, there's no there's no tumbleweed, there's no cactus, there's no like expanse of stones. Um, it's pretty lush looking, but this technically you could call this a zero escape. So you're addressing water runoff by slowing it down into the mulch and you're anchoring the soil in so it doesn't run off as well with boulders and you've set back some smarter plantings that don't require a lot of water and they can handle some salt runoff in the winter. All right, so another close up, just a little, and they're very happy with it and it's thriving. So very little, once all the plants are established, um, there's very little watering needed with these, with these plants. So the side yard, Similar thing, we went ahead and ripped out everything that was there, took out all the stuff they were storing, took out the lilacs. Um, one thing I want you to notice is that we had landscape fabric. No, there's no landscape fabric anywhere in this front yard. So if you take one thing from tonight, it's that you don't need to put landscape fabric under mulch. There's no reason for it. It's not going to do any good. I don't care how many other landscapers say you should do it. It doesn't stop weeds in the long term. <laughs> and when you want to go change something, ah, oh, you have so much fabric to deal with under there and it's just a pain. So the point of mulch is to have this integration with the soil. There's this interface between the mulch and the soil and it's actually carbon. So it's sitting on top of your soil, slowly breaking down and adding carbon. Now we did do landscape fabric here because we're going to put down a bunch of little stone. And so if you just had little stone on top of the mud, it would get mucky and full of weed seeds and it'd be a mess and they would call me and complain in two years. So we put down the fabric um, and cut punched holes in it for where we put in plants. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, let me get to my slide here. Whoops, there we go. So this was essentially their no man's land. They just, they also have um, windows. That's their neighbor's kitchen window that looks right into this area. It's really, uh, their garage door comes out here. Like, what do you, it's just for passing through, but they're retired and so they're passing through all the time and they really wanted it to look pretty. They wanted to address every corner of their property. Um, and so we started off by filling in our bones where the boulders and larger plantings went and then we finished it with all these perennials again this is their escaping so pretty lush looking um and for the keen folks in the audience you might notice something that looks like a mistake so full sun full heat loving fescue right here it's like two feet away from a shade loving hosta how can those coexist that doesn't make any sense but if you understand that that first piece of xeriscaping, if you understand your site and you work with your structure, these homeowners knew that throughout the summer, it was full shade from the, from the fence, from about the rocks back and full sun forward. So they had like this weird little window where they could plant some very, very different things and get some different texturing in. 
um, and it's working out really great. So no water runs through here. It's just the, the feel of a creek, dry creek bed. Um, we had sprayed it down with water to tidy it all up for the photo. And, and that's so now this is like their favorite place to sit and have morning coffee. And we planted some nine barks, um, some things that could tolerate that deeper shade right where they'll eventually get up and block sight lines from their neighbor's windows in like a really polite, nice way. It's not like a bam, like a wooden structure, like don't look over here. This is just a subtle like for your viewing pleasure as well, right? So, and we were able to accomplish that with two shrubs. So that's pretty cost effective as well. All right, the next, oh yeah, so those are the anomalies there. Okay, the next principle is amending your soil. I mentioned we all have clay soil, unless you've been really working at it, um, amending your soil, we're probably all battling with heavy clay soil. I know I am still. So this is what clay looks like when you pick it up and pinch it in your hand. It remembers what your hand shape is. If you're wondering, this is a great easy test. Go out after it rains, dig up some of your soil. If it holds that memory of your palm, you've got clay. Um, yeah, so clay is not the worst thing in the world because it's actually full of nutrients. It, the issue is that it's made of really flat, tiny particles. They're like little plates. So when I go in after rain and I step all over my garden um, or I drive over it with heavy equipment because we're still building the house, it just those plates just pack, 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 pack down until it's almost like concrete. When it's dry, you can barely get your shovel in it. And when it's wet, you can barely get it off your shovel. Um, so you have to change that because although it's full of nutrients, plant roots can't get through that compaction and access the nutrients. So on the flip side of clay, sometimes there's sand to deal with. Most there's some there's some places throughout southern Alberta that have sand, but for the majority of us do not see much sand on our properties. Sand is different in that it drains away water really quickly and it doesn't hold a lot of nutrients. So it's great for drainage, um, but it's it's not great for stopping runoff or holding on to holding on to the things that the plant roots need. Um, and don't make the mistake of thinking you can fix clay with sand because essentially you're making concrete. <laughs> if you mixed in some straw, you would have cob and you could actually build a house. <laughs> so don't think that, you know, I'll do one up on Mother Nature. Don't do that. The best thing to do is introduce um, loam and you can make your own loam by composting. So this is the long game. This isn't like a quick overnight fix. You can buy compost, you can buy loam, um, but if I were to squeeze this, it would kind of hold the shape of my hand, but it'd be loose and crumbly. And if you were a delicate new plant root hair, oh, that's just like the best. That's like the best feeling in the world because you can move through it easily and you can access all the rich nutrients that are in there. And so how do you get this into that? without a massive undertaking. My favorite way to do it is once you've mapped out your plant layout where you're gonna be putting plants, just backfill with this stuff. Take out the clay, mix them half and half if you want, if you don't wanna have a ton of clay left over for whatever. Um, and you'll start to introduce all the life that's teeming in here, these microorganisms that can break down and access the nutrients in here and release them to the plant roots. So it's like this cool sort of symbiotic relationship where they're accessing nutrients and they're giving them to the plants, which also give them gifts as well. So it's not just um, the nutrients and the texture, it's that it's alive. And those living things get work their way slowly through the clay and allow it to come out to the plants that you're putting in, that you spent good money on or you've spent a lot of time nurturing and growing from seed. Um, yeah, you can also, you know, you can also do raised beds or you can do berming. That's another way to introduce loam pretty quickly to your property. So there's a little bit of dig out. You'd have some some disposal or you'd have to get creative with what you do with your dig out. Um, and that's another way. But I really enjoy just amending as I go. So again, it's a slow game. You're not going to get your whole property done overnight unless you have a really big budget and lots of time on your hands. Um, yeah. So the other thing to remember, um, and I want to say this as like a reassurance, is a lot of xeriscape friendly plants, they don't actually need this. 
They like gravel. They like sand. They like broken up clay with some rocks and bits in it. Um, think of a cactus. A uh, cactus wouldn't really do super great in all this rich, you know, humus rich soil. They actually don't mind a little deserty, you know, think of Drumheller. It's not rich in, in black dirt over there. They've got some of those sort of windswept sandstone type landscapes and the plants that thrive there are very water wise because they don't have a lot of anything keeping them anchored in or a lot of precipitation feeding them. So. Yeah, you're going to find a nice balance between poor soil and, and built up awesome soil. All right, the next principle is using water efficiently. I've been talking about it nonstop and I'm not going to stop till we're done. Um, so if you hopefully you can see the map. Um, we're getting drier and we're getting hotter and we all know this and that's some of that doom and gloom. But you know, these are natural cycles as well. They're getting more extreme because of climate change and because of larger environmental impacts. Um, but it's neat to, if you can go on the prairieclimatecenter.ca website and just look, they, they keep pretty up-to-date um, mapping systems of our weather, our precipitation. You can check all different aspects of our weather and how it looks physically on the land. Um, so this is, these are projections to 2050. Um, and this is the temperature. So we're looking like we're getting a little warmer and we're looking like we're getting a little drier. Um, no big surprise, but how do we respond to that as gardeners and homeowners and stewards of our watersheds? So we have to get a little smarter with uh, maybe not rolling out sod, but planting some smarter plants. So um, let's see here, let me find my notes. So gardening basically has become the game of predicting the unpredictable. Um, but we can adapt our habits and still protect the joy of working with the earth. And yeah, it's as long as you can adapt your taste and your sort of your aesthetic, there's no reason that we can't continue to garden. So we're just honing our abilities to match our conditions. All right. Another map for you here. So this is the drought monitor. I just pulled this up um, the other day because uh, the last one I had was the last time I did this presentation and I wanted it to be as current as possible. So that's the January 31st of this year. It's not looking as bad as the one I had on here before, which was two years ago um, when I did the a similar presentation for the garden show in Calgary. But this sort of area was red before and our winter has the snowfall that everybody groans about and they're very excited to see it go away. It's actually a really awesome thing that we have all this snow sitting out there and we don't want it to melt and run off too fast because it's keeping us in this really cool, comfy, <laughs> moderate yellow zone. Um, if we get into these darker reds, that means our plants, trees, all of it is gonna get really stressed and you might even see more intense water restrictions coming on. So yeah. Um, not, and this is, yeah, just to show you, we're kind of, you know, with Okotoks, Calgary area, we're in that sort of orangey yellow zone, which is abnormally dry. That's the best this map shows. So we're abnormally dry, moderate drought. And I would say for the last five years or so, we've been in a drought, in a drought condition. So this might look familiar. <laughs> I raise your hand if you've seen this. I feel like if you're from Okotoks, you, you know this well. Um, yeah, I love this. <laughs> I don't live in Okotoks. I'm like, come on, Calgary, we need this. And eventually I think we'll get there. But um, so the town of Okotoks has been a real positive um, driver of, of good change with water usage. And you guys all know this intimately because you have to adhere to this. Um, so the Denver Water Department as well, they have, they've you know, recommended that this is how municipalities should be should be going. Um, and it's awesome to see that Okotoks is proactive. And it to me, um, and I think my stats are a little um, old now, but at, at one point, Okotoks, the population here grew by 45% in one year and the water usage dropped by 41%. So that is mind boggling to me because while you almost doubled in population, you halved your water consumption. That is amazing. So that 
you know, when you think about how can we make a change, that's it right there. And that's such an awesome example to other municipalities, maybe other larger cities just to your north that could get on board and start to implement some actual, um, you know, restrictions, not just we recommend and we just sort of fingers crossed hope everybody does this. And I, I don't want to make any enemies with the city. <laughs> um, we love the city and we love the parks program. And, you know, the city does, the city of Calgary does an amazing job with, on their website, they also have a lot of resources for choosing right plants and proper planting and water wise planting as well. Um, but just we haven't, it's probably such a large undertaking. We haven't seen restrictions come in just yet. But I, and no, I'm, I'm not doubting that they'll come. Um, I've been in chats with uh, folks in Airdrie who are developing this very thing as we speak. So it's coming. So you're ahead of the game. You're comfortable with it already, which is great. All right. Moving on to the next principle, using water efficiently. It all comes back to water. All right, so let me get to, oops, I'm wondering if, yeah, okay. Using water efficiently. So we often get precipitation here in large, fast doses. When we get our rains, they're not like little, wonderful, gentle sprinkles that we get throughout the whole month of June or that. It's usually like a pelting of rain slash hail, whatever you want to call it. Maybe there's snow all four, se four seasons in once. And when our snow melts, I'm feeling spring in the air. I don't know about you guys. I see a ton of snow and I feel like it's just going to whoosh out of here. So yeah, in like a lion, out like a lamb. I don't know. I feel like that might be our, our year this year, but no guarantees. I wish I could predict the weather. Um, so yeah, I one thing as a landscape designer, I love looking around my natural environment for ideas. So I take walks in Fish Creek Park. And do you know what this is? Do you know what animal has been busy here? Yeah, yeah this is a beaver. So I'm sure you see beaver activity here along the riverways as well. They are the original, they are the OG landscapers, right? And a lot of, we have this weird um, love-hate relationship with beavers because they're constantly messing with our waterways but it's they're their waterways not ours <laughs> so if you really think about it when it rains all this rain up river is going to come rushing down here and without this dam here it would come rushing past and it would probably undercut the bank and take out the you know the the, the scrub willow and maybe even um, sort of knock down some of the poplars that are in the river basin and away goes all that nutrients in the in the silt and it just goes downstream and eventually downstream is like all the way out to the ocean right so we're losing a lot um, of local resource so this smart creature which has evolved to do its thing has found a way to slow it all down so they usually have a succession of dams and they create these plateaued river faces which are really cool to explore, especially if you have kids. So what is, happens essentially is they slow the water down. They're catching a ton of that silt in all this brush that they've piled up and no real riparian areas are too damaged yet. So I, now this, this year, I'm excited to go down and see. This will probably be way more flooded up here. So they are changing things. They are changing the landscape. And that's where my commentary on beaver activity will stop. <laughs> I just wanted to show that this inspires me to think about how to capture water and slow it down on our properties. Um, yeah, so you can do, so this is not a beaver dam, but this essentially captures the same idea. Another, this is sort of that dry creek bed look again. So you're capturing this huge runoff from this big roof, it all comes down to the same spot. And without this, this whole area was getting, it was so undercut that they're getting cracks in their driveway. And they said, we need to stop this. So they had all these ideas and they wanted to French drain everything. And I said, why don't you just put a bunch of rocks there? And then you can plant. So they've got um, a smaller growing spruce and then some of these water loving plants in here. So the water runs down the eaves, hits the rocks, slows down enough that it's able to leach back into the beds, feeding these plants, and then find its way out to the city septic. So it goes out that way. And so another example here, um, these guys needed a little help. Things had gotten a little out of control. And again, they're down, so it comes down and it was feeding these sort of diseased maydays and it was just unsightly. And we came through and 
not the same view, but this is the same spot. We tore out all the old um, plant material, slowed the water down with some of this rock work, did some nice plantings, mulched it to capture more water and slow it down and directed it towards the driveway and the street. Um, so now they have, they can actually see out of their front porch area and back out of their driveway safely. So th this is another example of xeriscaping. And what I love is that the neighbors got inspired and did sort of similar all on their own. So this was enough for them to go, oh yeah, I like that. So it's like a little slow movement, which is happening, which is really cool. All right, we also can do rain barrels. I feel like we might talk about rain barrels at some point because we have one right here with us. It just sort of migrated in here before you all showed up. But we can capture water off. Uh, we should be trying to use water that runs off our roofs as much as we can. So instead of turning on the tap, if we can go ahead and fill some rain barrels um, or make rain gardens, find a way to either capture it in a container or keep it even better in the root zone of our gardens, that's how we can begin to use water more efficiently. Um, yeah, okay, so I, with some of you, I talked about my yard. <laughs> this is a personal project now. Um, so once you've got a good design, you have an understanding of how water flows through your property, um, you can start to really get into the fun stuff. So this is like icing the cake. This is the softscaping you'll hear sometimes landscapers talk about. So when we moved in, this is my house. There's my son totally playing away, doesn't care, give a care in the world about what mom's doing. Um, there is this rock wall built and quack grass and a mature spruce tree. And I was like, well, I like the rock and that's it. <laughs> I like the shade from the tree, um, but its roots were everywhere and the rock wall is poorly built and the neighbor kids would run along it and rocks would fall off and I was sort of a liability there and I just, like the beaver, I couldn't help but like get in there and start tweaking things and playing with it. Um, so yeah, anyway, back to plants. Um, yeah, quack grass does not complement the environmental conditions too much. You know, it's it's not, it requires a lot of water. Well, it's supposed to be bluegrass, like Kentucky bluegrass, which is what I, we were talking about being a little bit like politely greedy with our plants. What does bluegrass give me? Just makes me like think, oh, that's green and nice, but I have to water it all the time. I have to weed it. It doesn't feed me anything. It's not attracting pollinators. So I just said, no, no to the grass, it's out of there. I do like the tree. It provides habitat for wildlife. We get red squirrels and birds fly around in there. And so we kept the tree. Um, but the idea with plants is to choose the right ones and put them in the right spot. And that is just a lot of research. And I have some plant lists coming up, um, but you can start to check out books, do a little research, walk around your neighborhood, look at what's working in your neighbor's yards and start to, amass your your shopping list or what you're going to grow from seed or trade at plant swaps. So this is what it looks like the first year. Um, and so I went through and I found some plants. I have sedums. I have some repeating bloom daylilies. I have ornamental grasses. Um, we've been there 10 years and I've changed a whole bunch of this because I just can't help myself. But the structure is the same and the base plants are the same. I've just continued to add. And I can divide, I've divided my daylilies and that. So one little tip that I have when you're first landscaping, it, it, it'll it look like really bare. You'll see a lot of mulch and you'll be like, oh, I just wanna add more. Just don't because <laughs> just actually do if you want to, but understand how big are all these little baby plants gonna get? How big are they actually gonna get? Um, and then plan for that, leave that room for them because they'll be much healthier if they have room to grow to their mature size instead of you crowding them and there's poor air circulation and then it just looks like a big jumbly mess. Um, so what I did was I tucked in, I practiced so much restraint, I got one flat of petunias and I tucked them in and then because I like plants that give me something, I planted pumpkins and you don't see, not a lot of them had come up at that point, but the whole front yard was full of vegetables. There was Swiss chard and garlic. And so my neighbors went from wondering who the heck moved in and blew up the front yard with all the rock unstacked and soil exposed and grass gone to kind of being okay with me. And by now, 
Um, now I can take plants out of my yard and share them to my neighbors. Everybody got a pumpkin. Now people come, they're like, I'm out of garlic. I'm like, I got you. So so <laughs> this this front space is now productive and no fencing, right? This could be Okotoks. There are deer that go through here and drop their fertilizer every single night. Um, there's jackrabbits that come and think that like, ooh, they look just like one of these round field stones. They love these field stones. They just like hunker right up against one as if I can't tell what they are. And yes, I will go out with a dish towel and be like, get, get out of here. But mostly I let them stay because they don't eat any of these things. They leave it all alone. So I planted in the first year, I did make a few mistakes. I had a couple of shrubs, they got chewed to nubs. Somebody said you can grow blueberries here. So I tried that and that was ridiculous. And then I switched to honeyberries and they don't touch them. Um, so I just evolved my practices. I evolved my plant selections over time and observation. And I would I would encourage you to do the same. On the note of plants, um, like I said earlier, just get them established one to two seasons of regular watering. So it doesn't feel super water wise the first couple of years, but you water in the morning, water in the later evening, um, give them long, slow, deep drink drinks with like a trickle instead of blasting and being like, okay, good. You're just watering the surface when you, when you do that quick sort of watering. Um, water smartly for the first few years till they're established. And then this is, self-sustaining at this point. I barely do anything out here. So the pathway at the top gets some weeds in there and I'll I'll pull weeds, but I, I do actually sit there and enjoy the view. So that's a nice feeling because people say, oh, it must take so much work. It really doesn't because I'm in other people's yards so much. Um, so this is another view um, the next year. So some of my perennials, salvia, dianthus, um, Autumn Joy sedum, Vera Jameson sedums, um, my Burginia, moss phlox, ornamental grasses, I love them. They all started to fill in. And so this is a little bit more what it looks like now, but there's there's less mulch that you can see. So no grass and no maintenance. Well, very little maintenance. So it you can actually obtain a yard that you don't have to spend hours and hours in. All right. So other plant selections, I just want to go through some of my favorites. Again, I have a list and hopefully either I can share it to you guys and you can email out a plant list. But um, this was the perennial uh, plant of the year with the Horticultural Society for a long time or for one year. It was, it's This is called a red pasque flower. So it's a, a close cousin of the pasque flower, the prairie crocus that we see bloom in our naturalized areas. Um, the ones out in the wild are sort of a mauve purple color and they come in before even the snow melts away all the way. You just think, wow, this is our first color. You have to look close for it. But once you see it, these get snowed on, they don't care. The deer don't eat them. Look at those hairs. The deer hate that texture. So those are beautiful um, red pasque flower. Bulbs. I really took a while to embrace bulbs because I was so busy with perennials, but planted a ton of tulips and watched them get eaten. Now I love daffodils because <laughs> the deer tend to leave them alone and they have started to multiply and they look awesome. Uh, again, my burginia, you wouldn't often think of this as a water wise plant, but in the right spot. This takes zero attention from me. Um, and it's a really pretty early spring bloom. So I like, I want my landscape to be giving like slow fireworks, like something going off at all different points in the summer. So these are really early spring flowers. Um, the Haskap in the background here, you can see the baby robins always find their way into it and we compete for the berries. But isn't that cool that the robins fledge right when the Haskap is producing fruit. It's like this phenological miracle that's just like, I just makes me want to jump up and kick my heels. Like, yes, it's working. And then I tell my kids, if you want berries, you better get out there. Um, so yeah, this is a shrub. It's in the honeysuckle family, super hardy here, and it makes berries. Um, and also the flowers on it are sort of inconspicuous, light green. And the bumblebees that come to those early spring flowers are like, helicopters they're like the biggest bumblebees i've ever seen in my life i don't know where they come from or where they go but they love 
honeyberry bushes. They love the flowers. So if you plant those, get ready for some awesome um, pollinators to come through. Primula, there's a few different kinds and colors. I love my Primula because it's a low growing spring bloom. Again, it just divides itself and spreads out and it really is like very low maintenance. Um, so these are all spring, spring blooming. Moving into summer, my salvia, um, the oils in this plant are very deterrent to wildlife. They hate the smell of this. And look at how beautiful it is. And if I, if these uh, flowers start to fade, I just trim them back. I just deadhead the spent flower buds. And then within about two to three weeks, I get a whole nother show. And last summer I got three bloomings out of my salvia. So that was awesome. Uh, that was the most I've ever had, but I was on the ball with deadheading. So moving into my backyard a little bit here, I wanted to show you how can you do this with vegetables a little bit as well. So I know I'm pushing the limits of their escaping. Most people wouldn't consider vegetable gardening, but you saw pumpkins in the front yard. Ground covers, I just wanted to show you the red creeping thyme. This is like danger zone when it's flowering. I tiptoe so carefully because it is just swarming with honeybees. And they are in there and under there and you don't always see them flying around. So I have stepping stones and I walk very gingerly so that I don't get stung on the arch of my foot, which would hurt really bad. Um, I planted a six pack of these from the hardware store that I got. This is like year three. They just spread like crazy. They, I didn't put any soil under them. It is packed gravel. I packed all the gravel so I could lay my flagstone nice and level. It's just completely crusty old soil that I dug out of the front yard. It's basically like you dig that out of the alley, throw some red creeping thyme on it, and it loves it. So awesome there, escape ground cover that you could try. And just peeked in here, one of my favorites, I'll show more of um, hens and chicks. They're just the coolest little plants. I'll show you more. So there's one there. So they have really funky flowers, but for the most part, they're just these cool little squishy little succulents that stay low to the ground and they come in a zillion different color variations. Um, and again, the pollinators love them. If you want a truly no maintenance plant, this is your bud right here. You don't need to do anything to them and they will grow where the magpies tuck them in. They will grow on the sidewalk. They will grow anywhere. There is there's nothing healthy soil wise behind this rock wall and somehow I don't even think they're touching soil um, and they're still growing. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's where the neighborhood dogs pee. I don't know, but they're doing really well. <laughs> they're doing really great. So again, another, um, you can see the variation in the hen and chick colors. So they're called hens and chicks because you get the hen and she sends out little chicks and you can actually pluck those off and just literally stick them in wherever and they'll just root in and grow. So they're, they're very, very easy to propagate and sometimes they just do it on their own. So again, wide range of color um, and they, uh, you can, so there's the chicks. This one actually, these stay alive all winter. So I don't know how they do it. They're just completely exposed. They get buried in snow on a frozen rock and they're like, no problem. So <laughs> really awesome choice. Um, this is a Stella de Oro daylily. Uh, they bloom all summer long. I love them. They attract pollinators. And those are the ones that I now can divide and share with neighbors. Daylilies are the, the gift that keeps on giving. Ornamental Allium um, is another one that I love. I love this for seed saving as well. So they put up these really long blooming um, flower heads. And then each of these little purple pods produces one nice little black seed. And you can let these dry out and put them in a paper bag and just shake it. And then you've got a bunch of seeds that you can replant and they grow really easy. Ornamental onion, it's an allium. So nothing eats this wildlife wise. So it's related to garlic and onion um, that we eat. And so the animals leave it alone. And this will bloom all, this will bloom for like more than a month. So I love it. It's really dependable. Poppies. Um, you, not all poppies are super xeriscape friendly, but I find that they uh, self-seed readily. So again, I like things that are very low maintenance and I can just sort of go, Whew, there you go. And I'm going to back away and see what happens. Poppies will come up and they'll be completely um, 
just beautiful in their variation in color. They can be all white, all red, all pink, orange ones. I love this one. This is from a community garden. Um, just really pretty colors on that one. Again, another poppy. The flower or the leaf texture is also really interesting. It's sort of a slate bluey green. So it's also not just about flower color and bloom time. It's also about texture and the foliage, which makes your landscape more interesting and lush looking. Annuals. Um, I don't know, Lobelia and I don't get along and it's because I planted in too much sun, I think, but I then I put it in the shade and it hates me there too. So, but the one that I wanted to show you is um, moss rose or portulaca. So this is an annual that you can seed yourself or buy at the garden center and put in your planters. Um, they're a succulent and they do really well with poor soil, full sun and tons of heat. So if you just have that like dead desert zone in your yard, try portulaca. And there's so many different colors of flower. And then other annuals, sunflowers. I think we've all embraced sunflowers in the last little while, supporting uh, friends in Ukraine. Um, and they attract pollinators like crazy. I love waking up first thing in the morning when I take my kids to school in the fall and the bumblebees have slept there all night long because they're just too cold to go anywhere else. So they just kind of zoom into a sunflower, tuck in for the night, and they're still blooming and looking beautiful by the heat that comes on later in the day, and then they can fly away. Um, yeah, you can save the, <laughs> this is my 10 year old. I love it. He, I'm like, okay, he does garden, just not what I want him to do, but that's good. <laughs> So you can you can save the flower heads. You'll start to see um, migratory songbirds that maybe you never saw before. Uh, yellow finches will come, crossbills will come, and they love these seeds. So yeah, the yellow finches finally found us. I heard I was in the house folding laundry or doing something by the window, and I heard this beautiful song. I had not heard before and I just sort of snuck up to the window and there were all these yellow finches flitting around getting fat and sassy on our sunflower seeds before they flew away for the winter and they're really skittish once they spotted me they were out of there so so I just let them I let them eat the smiley faces uh some natives that are really interesting this is called echium rubrum or um red feather really funky looking plant it comes the the base of the plant is this rosette sort of hairy looking sort of like or almost like an ornamental grass and then it shoots up these three foot tall windy twisty dr seuss looking flowers that produce a million and a half seeds so they self-seed they aren't invasive they don't spread too much um, and yeah, this is a seed that I got from a listener when I was on the radio. He just actually came to the station and gave me a packet of these seeds and I have them all along the outside of my fence along the alleyway. And the neighbors all think they're really funky and cool looking. So, and now they've spread, I have about four or five. And if I ever wanted, if they ever grew where I didn't want them, I could easily pull them out. So they're, they're, they're not hard to control. Another native, this is our native cactus, and I just love it. Much like the, much like the hens and chicks, you all you need is one of these little pads to break off, or you get your leather gloves on and you break one off of your neighbors, like I did with permission. Um, actually, their daughter walked, you know, the little, the little leather booties that kids wear when they're first learning to walk. She walked through their cactus patch with those on totally didn't bother her but then they ended up with all these broken pieces of cactus and so they said yeah if you want some so i gingerly picked up a few and i i just laid it on the ground this is what broke off this whole big chunk i just kind of shoved the base of it in the ground just a little bit and it i thought is it blooming because it's stressed because <laughs> it's not gonna make it um so i watched it for that first year i didn't water it too much just enough to kind of make it feel at home and I have had blooms every year for three years now. So just gorgeous. You get everything from yellows to pale pinks and oranges. Um, they're just really pretty. And these rundle stones get boiling hot in the summer. This is full Southern exposure. So they get hot to the touch. I can't even step on these stones barefoot. And this is the ideal spot for this cactus. And the pollinators love them as well. 
Um, purple coneflower. This is another lovely uh, xeriscape friendly plant. We've seen this, um, you know, as you drive by, these sort of are head turners and they do bloom way into the end of summer. And the bumblebees and butterflies just love the nectar from these plants. Uh, I'll zip through some more here. We've got Russian sage and coreopsis. Just the beautiful pairing. You can start to not only think what plants do you want, but then how do you want to put them together? What are the color combinations? What are the texture combinations? And that's where you can really get your Xeriscape to really come alive and look very inspiring and, and thriving. Um, push them kind of together. In here, we've got Silver Mound. This doesn't really flower or the flowers aren't really noticeable. But again, nothing eats it. It provides a lot of texture and color and it's it's virtually maintenance free. I don't do anything to it till I cut it back in the spring. I just let the snow crush it all winter. There's I know there's probably ladybugs and stuff in there all winter and then I just clear it out um, by middle of June sometime. Sedums, a zillion different kinds of sedums that either grow low or they grow tall. Uh, sedums are your best friend in landscaping and one that I absolutely love sort of the unsung hero are these ornamental grasses. So they're, they're not really for attracting pollinators, but this courtyard that we landscaped is only ornamental grasses. That's all they wanted. They don't like bugs. They didn't want flowers. They didn't want color. They wanted to complement their, their um, sculpture here. So we brought in seven different kinds of ornamental grasses and planted them in grids. And that's not what I would do at my home, <laughs> but it really works in that setting. So you can get a lot of variation and interest with just one kind of plant. Uh, just depends what your site allows for. So mulch would be the, one of the last principles here. We're going to talk about mulch. Oops, let me get to the right spot here. There we go, mulch. So mulch, um, you saw in some of the earlier photos, it's it's really a multitasking material. So it's shredded up tree bark, essentially, is what it is. Um, byproduct from the lumber industry, mostly. Uh, but it, it can also be dried leaves, dried grass clippings, um, basically any, any carbon heavy material that's dry and will form that integration with the soil. So eventually it will become part of the soil. Um, there is a little bit of refreshing needed, but it's not yearly. I top up my mulch probably once every five or six years. Um, it helps keep weeds from competing with the other plants. It looks nice. Again, it's that frosting of the cake that looks just that, that finishing touch. Um, it can take uh, runoff, uh, not quite as good as stone, but it can take some runoff and slow down that water. Um, stone would be also considered a mulch because it's a top dressing for your soil. So. Uh, when, like that, that uh, rundle stone will absorb heat and radiate it back in our cold nights. So that's often, it's a heat sink. So it, it's often useful in that way. Um, and then, yeah, it, like I said, uh, bark mulch will, will produce or is carbon um, and it creates habitat and cover for some of our microorganisms. Um, here's an example. This is just called chop and drop. So this is sort of a permaculture technique where you pull up the plant right where it grew and just lay it down. And that's mulching that bed. So this is an Inglewood community garden in the city of Calgary. When I came through in the early spring to just check things out, the bed was pretty dry where it was exposed and I lifted this up and it was nice and damp under there. Just this little bit of scraggly, I don't even know what that is. It looks like old tomato plants, um, but that's enough to just protect it over winter and give that bed just that much of a jump start for when they plant it um, to their veggies for the spring. Burlap, why not? It breaks down. You can find it for free. Um, as long as it can be dampened and create that interface with the soil, it'll stay anchored. And then, of course, once the garlic starts to grow up through it, then it's fully anchored and you can just let it decompose in place. So it's holding the moisture in, it's keeping weeds at bay, um, and it's actually eventually gonna add organic matter to the soil. You can do living mulch. This is moss phlox. It's a ground cover. It's an evergreen ground cover. So it actually stays green in the winter. Sometimes my rabbits that come through will eat this, but for the most part, it's worth it because that's what it does in the spring. And it's beautiful. It just makes this carpet of blossoms. And that technically is a mulch because it's spreading everywhere like that red creeping thyme. So no weeds can compete with that. 
it's keeping the moisture in um, and eventually it's sort of dropping leaves and, and petals and adding to the soil structure as well. Kinnikinnik uh, or uh, bearberry is another one you'll see out in nature here quite a bit. This just grows at the base in our sort of where our prairies meet um, woodlands areas and it's a really beautiful ground cover that does quite well here. And yeah, so here we have mulch. Um, these sedum will continue to grow as a mat, same with the hens and chicks, but in the meantime, here's the stone that can help uh, trap heat and slow down runoff. And we planted it with succulents and, and uh, cactus. You can eat some of your ground cover. So this is strawberries. And now this whole area is a strawberry patch on 17th Ave where people can walk by and have a snack if they want. So why not? And strawberry send out runners are very easy to spread and grow. Um, this is one of my favorite principles of xeriscaping. So this, and we've got one more. So shrinking lawns. Lawns kind of came about because we used to graze sheep in our front yard. And by we, I mean like, in Europe, they used to do this. <laughs> um, we don't really do that much anymore unless you live on a farm and you probably wouldn't give them Kentucky bluegrass anyway. <laughs> so um, yeah, you don't have to get rid of the lawn altogether. That's a big step for most people. It's a, it's a statement in your neighborhood. You're going, oh yeah? And your neighbors might respond like, oh, well. So you can ease your way into it if you're not ready to jump in with both feet. Um, and you can start to do that by, this was all lawn, but it struggled. It was in the shade, it was against the concrete, which was heating it up too much. It was at the base of this suckering Schubert choke cherry. So work with what you've got. We cut in this bed. Now it's this nice buffer zone. There's still lawn, it's still nice and green. We're respecting our property line. Um, and we've got something else. We've got some variation to look at. And that's what it looks like now. So it went from this, we added some ornamental grasses and now, and we made it bigger. We just fully got rid of the lawn. And then this is what it looks like now. Um, this was last summer. We So this was the first year we lived in our house. And this was the, this is what, after 10 years, I was like, I'm doing it. So we finally did, did no more grass in the front yard. Um, and this is what it looks like fully now. So I'm not a big fan of that, like my side, your side look. I think it's really nice when you can get along with your neighbors and almost look like, where is that property line? But um, they really love their lawn a lot. And I just had this project that I needed to do using up more field, uh, the Rundle stone. And so that's that was my, that was my, Final hurrah. So this, if you want to go even farther into xeriscaping, you can get into rock gardening and this is called crevice gardening. So it's a variation of rock gardening where you're sort of mimicking how a mountainside sort of shears off. And there's so many beautiful plants that grow in like rock faces. You just think how, what are they accessing to stay alive? This is like the city version and a total newbie beginner version of this. Um, but I just, I packed in basically sand and gravel and then just topped it with a little bit of compost. And I tucked in all these low growing um, plants that should form little mounds and little buttons and, and fill this in really nicely. And then just, yeah, making use of ornamental grasses um, and other plants that do well in the heat. Here's some other examples of shrinking your lawn. This is the little red reading house in Inglewood. So it's a, um, uh, one, a, a, like a older home that they've turned into basically like a book lover's dream come true. You can go into the house and read books all day long. Um, and their front yard here is a, a unique mixture of some local art and this dry creek bed and pea gravel. And so the, hort the Horticultural Society came through and we did some plantings there. Um, Again, steep slopes, it's hard to get grass to grow on them anyway. You might as well just do something fun. You'll see, characteristic, you'll see a lot of rock work in Xeriscapes. Um, again, it's structural, it's beautiful, and it's functional. So that's one reason. Um, and then the last, the last piece here is maintaining. So you've done all this work, now you need to keep it up. And it's really not that much maintenance to do, um, to do your Xeriscape, or to maintain your Xeriscape. So like I said earlier, water until plants are rooted in, and then you can kind of step back, tend to them in a drought condition, you know, check in with them. If they're looking like they're struggling, give them a deep drink, but otherwise sort of leave things. If you've chosen the right plants, they should be fine. 
um, feeding things. Fertilizer, so I'm, I'm kind of a, a natural kind of gal. I don't really like a lot of synthetics or products. If it comes in a bottle, I'm probably not going to bother with it. Um, but I do like compost tea. You can buy some pretty good compost tea concentrates. I love compost. I just make my own. And so I pull my mulch back. I plop down a shovel full of compost. I push the mulch back. I do that in the spring every year. And I never have to feed my plants. Um, worm castings do the same thing. You can get into feeding your plants in different ways with biochar and mulch. Biochar is a sort of a specially prepared horticultural charcoal. And more what it's giving the soil is habitat for those microorganisms. So there isn't a ton of nutrients there, but it's giving habitat in the surface area that it provides for microscopic uh, decomposers. Um, and then just look after your plants. When they get bigger, those daylilies get divided, your shrubs get kind of overgrown, just prune them for, for shape um, and color. You can deadhead your plants so that they repeat bloom or so that you get rid of some of the scraggly bits. I like to leave a lot of stuff. I like things natural, so I leave a lot of stuff over winter. I feel like there's a lot of things that sort of live under that cover, and then I'll clear it out in the spring. Um, yeah, and like by spring, I mean June. <laughs> a lot of people are like as soon as that snow melts they're out there tinkering and moving things and I really say like just pump the brakes just hold off because there's a lot of living things that aren't awake yet um, that are hibernating still or that are taking cover under all those leaves and all that the one thing I guess I would say for cleanup I'll take my broadleaf stuff in the fall like hostas just because I don't like slimy handfuls of hosta leaves in the spring um, but yeah for the most part, just leave things. When in doubt, wait and observe. <laughs> so that's basically it. Um, yeah, this is, sorry, this is a picture of the compost I make. It's still usually rotting once I put it. So it's kind of like this weird mix of compost and mulch blends in with my mulch really nicely. And I just make that in my compost bin in the backyard. Um, that There's cleaning up a little bit there. That's a delphinium. This is in June. That's why I waited, because when I was doing it, out comes this mimic bee, bumblebee, there were ladybugs everywhere, and I was sort of like, should I even be doing this? Um, but I left all that leaf litter. I left all that, and I just I just cleaned up the upper dead stalks of things where they most likely weren't going to be hanging out. And that is their escaping in a very large nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for your attention. I hope that I hope that you are gaining some inspiration, um, questions, stories to share. I would love for you to wake up and and engage and tell me about your experiences or ask questions if you want some clarity. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is a draw for the rain barrel. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Oops. So I do the draw. Sure. You get okay. So this is everybody that that's joined us tonight. Yep. Everybody. And okay. I think okay. Right. Okay. I don't wanna. I can see names, so I'm gonna choose this one. And that is Tamara Webster. Tamara. Tamara. <laughs> 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 Okay. That's a nice problem. <laughs> you don't want us an additional one in your row of rain barrels? Oh, right on. Okay. Okay. How about Leanne Giesen? Odison? Oh, Odison. She's Ol Olsen? Olsen? I, I don't know how to. I think it was Odison. My Odison? handwriting is okay. horrible. You got it. <laughs> okay. Well, congratulations, so Leanne. Just check. On her way to using water wisely. Okay, okay awesome. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're online. If you can hear us, I will contact you about your rain barrel prize. Congratulations. <laughs> That's awesome. That's this is a beautiful rain barrel. It's got it's really big. It's got all the gear in it. Yeah. Where can we get one of those? Hardware. Home hardware? We got ours at home hardware. We've gotten them at Home Depot before. Yeah. Green Calgary is yeah. another great um, source for, for rain barrels. So they, if you can find them on Facebook or just go to their website, they'll announce when they're doing their sales. Come up to the city and yeah. Yeah. Did you have a question or yeah? My neighbor couldn't come tonight, but she wants to know, uh, 
she's like she's interested in uh, having an underground watering system sprinkler system. Mm, okay yep is that okay yeah absolutely so underground water underground um, watering systems what you're doing is you're you're becoming the controller of how much water and when it gets watered so um, if she can do it on a timer um, or now they're so fancy they have like moisture sensors and rain gauges and they're they can hook up to your smartphone. So if you're on vacation and it's raining, your sprinklers aren't going off. Um, so if she wants, like you can go full Cadillac or you can do your own. A cheap version of that would be something like a soaker hose buried under mulch. That's super DIY friendly. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's totally along the principles of water wise gardening because you're you're not losing anything to evaporation really. Um, and and you're timing it most likely to go off at like five in the morning, you know, when we both most people don't want to be up watering. So, yeah. I just wanted to mention too on on that note and on the rain barrel note, um, the town does have a rebate for rainwater harvesting systems for irrigating your gardens or your lawns. So it's for a big system that's over 500 gallons. Um, and you can get pumps and everything so that your whole garden, and you can even use a sprinkler for your lawn, is watered with rainwater. And so it's nice. not hooked up to your house at all. So we rebate 50% um, up to $1,500 if that's something that you're interested in. So I just thought I'd mention that out there. Yeah. In case. That's so a you lot can of have rain barrels on like super steroids. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. That sounds awesome. That would be nice. Think of your water bill. Mm -hmm. You know, in the summer, a lot of our water consumption doubles because we're washing cars and watering gardens and I don't know, showering more. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. So any way that we can cut that consumption back, especially in the summer months, is great. And we like we do get so much rain all at once. It's great if we can capture it in like a 500 gallon capacity. You know, that's and then have it to know that okay we're heading into the hot end of summer months but you've still got rainwater or snow melt that's amazing i heard i heard all the snow whoosh off the roof the other day and i was thinking should i open up my rain barrels or not it's like oh, it's risky we're going to still early um but yeah capture that snow melt in the in the late spring um and yeah capture all your rainwater if you can yeah we have a question from sure. online um this participant has tried four different types of poppies and none of them have grown in my mulch. Any ideas mm -hmm. why not? In your mulch? I think so they're pretty tender um, to come up. So if you have thick, chunky mulch, you might want to just scoot it away and have them be bare soil. Like when you seed poppy seeds, you know what they look like. Um, yeah, so they take a little. I would probably scooch the mulch away. Hopefully it's bark mulch because stone stone would probably keep most things from growing. Um, yeah, poppies, I just sort of I like feed the chickens kind of motion, like just like, and then they kind of all come up in sort of a mat and they'll self seed. Once they're up and they have one good season, they should self seed into the mulch. So hopefully that works. Yeah. Yeah. I have to get your question for the people online so they can hear. Oh, oh okay, with the microphone. Okay. So we live in a house with a front drive garage and a front porch, mm -hmm. and then we kind of share a front yard with the neighbors. That Their have front yard kind of house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we sort of share a front yard and my husband and I would like to have no grass mm -hmm. at all. And the next door neighbor, he loves his lawn and he's yeah. out there watering it all the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, We'd like to turn our whole yard into yeah. no grass, but how do you do that when you share a front yard with someone? Mm -hmm. I saw Let's your. See if I can go back here. So mm, you can you can do it in increments, um, where you start to creep up to the line a little bit, <laughs> like, "Hey, I'm coming," because um, if I can get back to okay, so that's what we did here. Yeah. We were new. I did not want to ruffle feathers. Um, our our neighbor is amazing, and she's lived there for a long time, and sh we love her. 
Um, so yeah, and plus I love curvy lines and I had just the right amount of stone, so I thought I'd do that, but then it's never enough. I always want to garden more and push limits more. So yeah, it's, she doesn't seem to mind. I don't know. I also thought about her lawn maintenance. So I put in a two by 10. I had that lumber. I thought about their weed whipper, their lawn mower. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to do anything that would bother, make more work for my neighbor, um, but also check all my boxes, right? So they can easily run their mower wheel right over this. I didn't plant anything too close to the edge of that. I've got mulch. Um, none of my plants really overhang too much. Um, yeah, so as long as you kind of, I don't know, start, I would say start gradually and have some conversations and then maybe just say, this is coming. So, yeah. I, I would love our sign to look like that, but would it look funny if there was, if we had a, like a, let me go a forward. Wood? That's what it looks like at my house. So that's a narrow strip. It might look different because you're, you kind of have mirror image, like you'd be right down the middle. Maybe there's a way to work with your neighbor where you can um, soften that edge. Because this, this does actually kind of bother me. The designer in me hates this. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of severe, but yeah, it's you, a statement. If you kind of make it yeah. wavy, then we we might have grass that we don't want, and he might have. We well, have to stay in your property line. Landscaping. Yeah, you'd have to. If I did this differently, I could have kept it all on my property and just curved this line. Maybe I just have like a garden that maybe I just extend this previous garden bed to down to like that step, and then leave the rest lawn. So they could still, and they were always maintaining this grass. They just were, her grown son was like, that's ours. I was like, well, it's not. <laughs> and, but also trying to be polite and being neighborly, right? Like I, I did want to do this project. It ties in nicely with the rest of the yard. Um, and I had the material and the time. And so I wanted to do it. So we kind of chatted. They know me enough to know that I'm going to plant every square inch of my property. Um, and I don't know, I share vegetables a lot and keep bees and share honey and shovel their snow in the winter. <laughs> Just if you want to soften it, because I know what you mean, you've got a middle, it's like going to be like this harsh line i would just stay within your property and just shrink your lawn to what makes sense mostly to like think of foundation beds so keep your beds following the contour of that front porch and your walkway or your driveway right so don't have something out in the middle that's sort of obtuse and doesn't really fit just kind of extend the beds off the foundation of the house off the foundation of your walkway and your driveway and that starts to shrink your lawn if you have a lawnmower, don't get rid of it yet or give your neighbor, you know, some some bonus to maybe just zip over and do a couple passes of your thin little lawn area. And then eventually maybe they move and you have like a quick little window of opportunity to like get in there and do it. <laughs> or maybe like the, the slide I showed, we went in and we um, got rid of that sort of eyesore of scrubby May days. And then the neighbors really were like, oh, you guys got all fancy. Maybe we should do some fancy stuff. It's like you buy a new dress, then you need the shoes and the, get your hair done and stuff. So sometimes it creates a chain reaction. Um, and having done our front yard the way we did, I don't think we made any enemies. I'm sure people have opinions, but they never, I mean, for the most part, we're, we're friendly with everybody. People stop and say hi. And what I've noticed is we have actually had people, not immediate neighbors, but people down the block and around the corner have come and said, can you help us? We, don't, we just want to get rid of our yard totally. And so, yeah, that's awesome. And so two neighbors now have taken the plunge and they've done it and they have something similar one has a hedge so it kind of softens it and and one on the one side of one of the houses they also put in the boards and one day there might be a better option you could do something different you could do natural stone which is pricey you could do paving like a nice pretty sort of cobblestone paving stone edge which is a little nicer a little bit more maintenance um, you could do concrete curbing really pretty so it just depends on your budget it depends on kind of like the evolution. Do you know you're going to shrink it more? Probably choose a, a natural edge 
if you're like, no, this is good, I'm good with this sort of just bumping the beds out into the lawn a bit more, then you could do something more more finished, like a concrete curbing or concrete, I don't know if you'd call that, they're escape friendly, but use what you have on hand. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, a microphone? Uh, yeah, with the blue sweater. <laughs> Okay. Um, I have my front yard is dark and damp. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like so really, shady. Really shady oh, yeah. and wet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't oh. get a lot of sun. I like hostas, but mm. <laughs> what else can I put in? So do slugs. Stuff? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like slug breeding ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, dark and damp. You know what? One of my absolute favorite super ultra shady plants is it's native as well ostrich ferns so embrace your ferns in shade gardens it's all about texture and foliage um most plants want six to eight hours a day of sunlight to make their make them happy and make them bloom and if they don't get that then they'll survive but they won't thrive you won't get as much color um so all the all the color all the texture comes through leaves in the shade garden so there's like, a, you could have just all hostas. I've seen that done before and it's beautiful, um, but might be kind of boring. Or if something comes through and bothers hostas at some point, you got to start all over again. Diversity is great. Um, Ligularia is another deep shade plant that I love. They, um, they almost look like uh, water lily leaves. Um, they're kind of purpley on the bottom. So they have a, a larger, more tropical looking leaf. And then when they're blooming, they send up this yellow flower spike, which is really striking, really eye catching. They're quite large too. Um, you could mix in some shrubs that would be good, like coral berry, um, gosh, hydrangeas would be awesome. Hydrangeas can handle a good amount of shade, especially like an Annabelle hydrangea or a quick fire. Um, yeah. Good questions. Shade. I'm thinking of other shady plants that I love. My, I, I don't know, um, old fashioned bleeding heart. They grow pretty well in sun and shade. You might just get less blossoms in the shade. But yeah, look into ferns. I feel like ferns are a whole nother world that I'm loving a lot. There's um, male ferns, lady ferns. Those are like super, super hardy here. And the ostrich ferns. Um, they're just, the texture is awesome. Yeah, and they divide really well. So yeah, <laughs> so get a couple, plant them, divide them, and yeah, you're on your way. The deer don't eat ostrich ferns, not that I know of anyway. Deer will eat, deer will eat anything, but they might not come back. So they're creatures of habit. I'm sure you all know this. Um, one trick that I learned with a, a client I have here in Okotoks, so front yard, totally exposed, no fencing, right? And she gets deer and she has all this stuff that is like deer's like salad bar so she put in some stakes throughout just sort of randomly throughout her garden and she just puts um fishing line just zigzags all the way around her stakes so eventually all the foliage grows up and you don't see the stakes and the deer come along like me in this power cord and trip on it or feel it and get spooked you're breaking their habit they're like oh yeah let's go over to joanna's house and eat all of her things <laughs> because they have been for like the last two months. But if I interrupt them, spook them, they usually will go away. That being said, new deer come along all the time. They're curious, they're like they can't deny that overwhelming smell of something new. They have a personal vendetta. I don't know what it is, but deer will eat anything. They'll come and nibble on anything to try it. But they're creatures of habit. So interrupt their habit or plant a whole ton of stuff that they don't like with Maybe that special one, like like your salvias, like your artemisia, those super strong, volatile oil plants that are just like super pungent. Like when we rub sage, you smell that instantly, right? That's a similar thing when they take a nibble. If anyone has ever nibbled on wormwood, like please don't. But if you have, you it's so bitter and it's so acrid in your mouth. Like I can't, I if I were a deer, I would never come back to that yard. So those unfortunately don't grow in shade, um, but yeah, but for the deer, <laughs> for the deer eating other things, try and find not only things that they don't eat, but things that they don't like. And it's some of those, um, those, those plants that have those volatile oils in them that are super pungent. 
like salvias, wormwoods, that kind of thing. Yeah, I saw another arm go up. Yes. Once you've done, you do the uh, the planning and the design. Mm -hmm. and then do you have another contractor to do the work, or do you do that? Yourself? Um, sometimes, sometimes I have companies that I recommend. So yeah, I just have working relationships with a couple companies that it's just not something I'm set up for or really want to handle, but they do. And so they'll, I have one company I work with for installation and one for maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see an arm. Yeah. <laughs> Reach. <laughs> Where we live, there's a ditch in front of our house. Mm -hmm. And the, the it has a steep slope and it faces due south. Mm -hmm. And nothing will grow on there. The grass, even quack grass, has a hard time growing on there. What could we plant in there? That's oh my gosh, that sounds grow. like a rock garden dream come true. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like. And the deer are there all the time. So my front yard, uh, kind of similar thing. Although I terraced it, um, do, can you? Is it your property? Like, can you actually dig into it, or is it like a drainage right of way? Yeah, yeah, so you don't want to touch kind that, <laughs> but you don't want to touch that. You don't want to mess with right of ways of any type because one, they're there for a reason, and two, maybe they will be doing something there down the line, and you really want to honor <laughs> the flow of water and access for the municipality All and stuff. Is like yeah. So yeah. So it's like a five, four foot ditch, and it's on a like. Super steep you need you need anchors then. So I would yeah. say you you could dig in some boulders. That's probably pricey and then like fairly permanent. And if they do come along and need to do any work in there, they're gonna move them and that's on your bill. Um, maybe even a fine if it obstructs their, you know. So I would say actually just stick with plantings. So look for deep rooted um, perennials and shrubs. Like low growing shrubs, especially evergreens would be really nice. So like a low sort of carpet type um, juniper would be great. Um, nest spruce are really cool. Uh, they don't need a ton of water once they're established. Ornamental grasses are awesome. Um, and if you can work in some rock work, that's yeah, like this, this little area, it does, you know, it doesn't slope steeply, but all the water does kind of come down here and it catches at these rock installations and in between there's sedums, ornamental grasses, um, ground cover sedums, which would help anchor that bank too. Um, yeah, so I would just I would just start planting it. Dig out all the quack grass or you can solarize it, which takes a little bit of time. That would be like spreading out um, sort of clear plastic and anchoring it down and not letting moisture get in and you're just going to cook the grass. So that takes quite some time. You just sort of have to look up how to do that. Uh, or you can, it's a little bit trickier and more finicky, but you can top it with a barrier like cardboard, really thick. Um, but there's some mixed thoughts on doing that. And then you're punching holes in that barrier to plant. So that's sort of like inviting the quack grass up anyway. Um, so even though it's not happy there, once you put in like amended soil and consistent watering, the quack grass will become very interested in staying. Um, so I would try and scrape out the grass first and get all the roots out because even a little section of quack grass root means a whole new plant. Yeah. And then just, yeah, just start um, kind of come up with a plan, like a, usually sort of lower growing mid height to taller or create sort of like if you can kind of like get the movement of the plants or the height of the plants to draw your eye, say to your front door or to a fence at the end or something like that, or a feature, like you want to put in a, a trio of shrubs, something like that. Just sort of work with height and leaf texture. You should be able to anchor it in pretty good. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Just think about vegetables. Yeah. So the zero escaping. Are there some vegetables that require less water? <laughs> vegetable. That's a good question. Sort of um, kinda. <laughs> so annual vegetables, a lot of them are like basically tropical. When you think of tomatoes and our solanaceae, sort of eggplant, peppers, those are like 
big feeders, big water consumers throughout the season, and you don't really want to skimp because you're after the harvest, right? Um, I would steer with that question, I would steer you more towards perennial food crops. So you don't always, it's it's way less work. Um, like think of strawberries or raspberries, hascaps, Saskatoon berries. Um, gosh, even a lot of root crops can kind of hang in there without too much water as long as your soil is root. Like with vegetable gardening, I would say my Xeriscape approach would be to focus on your healthy soil the most. Don't worry about what varieties right away. Don't worry about how much water. Just really get your soil like super pumped with really good aged compost because then you've got all this mixture of organic matter that is not only feeding the soil and housing all those microorganisms, but they're little sponges, like little shreds of bark. Yeah, avocado pits, whatever. Like I barely filter my compost because I think the more chunks, the more water they're holding. Um, and then when I water my garden beds, uh, I water them super deep and then I don't come back for like two weeks. I literally, I treat them like a sink till I see water running out the sides or out the bottom. And then I don't come back for quite a while. And I don't know if you guys, veggie garden, have you ever gone away and been so worried about your veggie garden and you came home and it was just like absolutely thriving? like from your neglect. I don't know, I always get this, I get this fear of like, I'm gonna be gone for two weeks, everything's gonna die. And I come back and it's like way better than if I would have just stayed at home and tinkered like I do. <laughs> so trust your veggie garden too, that it's probably okay to handle a little less attention. Yeah. Mulch yeah, I, yep, I definitely mulch. And I often will mulch with other plants because in my veggie garden, I'm all about production. So for example, if I plant one area to garlic, well, think about the spacing between garlic bulbs. There's so much bare soil. Um, my rule I follow is no bare soil, especially in my veggie area. And that's hard for a lot of North American gardeners to embrace, but no bare soil, because that means weed competition, evaporation, birds dropping seeds, whatever it might be, right? So um, I interplant lettuce with my garlic and then I get to pick the lettuce and the lettuce is keeping my garlic bulbs nice and cool and damp and they get bigger. So, and then right about when my lettuce starts to bolt and is looking pretty scraggly, I can pull it all out or chop and drop. I could chop and drop it and leave it and just wait for my garlic or I could pull all my lettuce out carefully to not disturb the garlic and I could interplant like a cover crop, like a fall planting of like annual rye or something like that. Just to basically always have something growing, continually growing, succession planting, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Any last questions?